What's going on, folks? This is Balaji from Brave Young Heroes. We are back with another session in the Raising Resilient Kids Summit. Now, their book, The Self-Driven Child, has been described as a battle plan to attack anxiety that's devouring our kids and decimating their native potential. It's been called a light into the darkness of test dread, chronic sleeplessness, and 24-7 social media. He's Bill and he's Ned. Now, Dr. Bill Stixrud is a clinical neuropsychologist at George Washington University's Children's National Medical Center. Ned is the president and CEO of the famous Prep Matters, and he's the co-author of Conquering the SAT. Their work has been featured on NPR, NewsHour, U.S. News, World and Report, Washington Post, The Wall Street Journal, on and on and on. These guys flow together better than Fresh Prince and Jazzy Jeff. Jay-Z and Kanye, salt and pepper. <laughs> they should seriously consider forming a rap duo. I would buy a ticket. Please help me welcome the infamous, <laughs> the notorious Bill Stixrude and Ned Johnson. Welcome, guys. I'm so happy you didn't say Millie Vanilli. <laughs> I should have thought of that. <laughs> well, I'm doing really well. It's a pleasure to have you guys on. I'm a big, big fan of your work. You guys have been a, a team up duo now for a number of years, and I'm glad you guys met. How did you guys start working together? Bill, you want to take that? Sure. Well, I, I, we, we can't. We don't exactly don't exactly remember <laughs> how how we met, but seven or eight years ago. Um, so, Somebody suggested we have a meal together, and we have a lot of shared interests. Um, we, we think a lot alike in terms of our experiences with kids are very, very different kind of careers. Our experience with kids have been very different. So we started lecturing together about motivation. We talked a lot. We gave a lot of lectures about how stress, how chronic stress or really severe stress undermines kids' development, how it affects their brain and their development in a negative way. And... We started talking about probably three years ago about writing a, a book about the stuff that we think is really useful. We're trying. We're looking for a way to organize, kind of an organizing principle. And at one point, says, "I think everything that we we teach that helps people is related to a sense of control." And so we started to focus on this sense of control, which we we've known forever. You know, that that, that with, with, you know, I've known for ten years that low sense of control the most stressful thing in the universe. If something's happening to you or something said happened to your kid, you don't know what to do about it. There's nothing more more stressful than that than that, than that helpless feeling. Mm. We, we knew that. We also knew from every place we looked to understand how do kids become truly self-motivated, to develop a life that makes sense to them. They have to have a sense of autonomy, control over their own lives. So we figured that this this must be a really big deal, the sense of control. It's so important for mental health. It's so important, it turns out it's really important for physical health, it's important for career success, academic success. It's good for everything because the brain works better when you have a sense of control. As opposed to feeling uh, helpless, hopeless, passive, or being really anxious and overwhelmed or depressed. And so we, 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 for the last three years, we've been writing about and lecturing about how important it is for young people to have a sense of control of their own lives. Wow, fascinating, fascinating. Now, there's a, a, I've seen a number of your presentations before and read the book, and you guys talk about a, a shift in terms of the new culture uh, of modern parenting particularly when it comes to academics. Could you kind of set the stage for us a little bit? How is modern parenting a little bit different from maybe what our uh, parents or grandparents went through? I think there, there are probably a lot of differences. I mean, you know, one of the principal things is just in today's world, that it moves so much faster and our, our brains are scattered and so much is being asked of us from so many different channels, both for kids and for parents, and we're all so much more sleep deprived than we used to be. Um, and then as parents, you know, we, we also, this, this narrative has developed, and I say this even as a test prep guy, but this narrative that has developed that the most important outcome of, of high school is where you go to college. Where you go to college really determines the whole course of your life. 
as opposed to, you know, what kind of person you are. Bill and I make the point of the, the most important outcome of, of high, high school and of adolescence generally is the brain that you're going to carry with you for the rest of your life. So, so where it used to be the, the, the goal for, for parenting, for communities, for schools, was developing kid, people of character. And so it's all of those non-cognitive skills of, of, stick, of grit, of stick to itiveness, and, and, and you know, the, those kind of things that, that we as parents would focus on. Now it's like it's our job to help our kids get top grades so they can go to a top school. And it's, 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 it, one, it's untrue, and two, it's dreadful and it's dreary. I mean, first of all, I mean, what do I know about high school biology? How can I really be on, on top of that? And it fundamentally changes the relationship that we as parents have with our kids that, that, that I've got to be on, on him all the time to do his homework or, some, or, his, or his future is ruined, as opposed to, you know, focusing on him, um, develop, helping my kids develop themselves as people. That latter one is that's what we should be doing as parents, and it's such it's so much more enriching than oh, okay, you got an A in us in the quiz, check what's the next quiz. I mean, ugh, who who wants that job? Mm. Mm. Wow, wow, yeah, and I feel that pressure as as a parent myself. But you guys talk about something that you like to call the twin scourge <laughs> for kids, and what are you referring to there? It, it's what I mentioned earlier, Balaji. It, it's this, it's this stress-related mental health problems. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we see kids, so many kids, who have what we consider to be distorted motivation. In the sense that Ned sees so many kids who are just obsessively driven, who think that the most, as Ned said, the most important outcome of their life is where they go to college, and they're terrified by the, the attended ninth grade. They aren't going to get into a good enough college. They're obsessively driven. I see a lot of kids who have learning disabilities and ADHD, a lot of anxiety, depression, and kids who just don't, who feel, what's the point of trying? Mm. And it, because I'm not a top student. So, it, and we figured that, as I said, that, that low sense of control is the most stressful thing you can experience. And that, so you, you look at that when, when there's a cluster of suicides here and there, but, but the professionals who come in, they, these kids feel helpless. But they, they feel existentially impotent. They feel like they can't, they just resign wow. to this highly stressful life that doesn't make sense to them. So it's that, it's the stress-related mental health problem. And this, that this lack of kind of internal motivation, this drive to develop yourself they have something useful to offer this world, mm. as opposed to just going through the hoops to get into college. Mm. And so we figure this sense of control, the sense of autonomy or agency, is such a crucial piece for developing, for addressing these twin scourges. Mm. I have a I have a colleague I have a colleague who's working with a, a, a new family, uh, and mom called up. Four times yesterday to talk to an, one of our admins here um, because the this tutor had yet to respond to the email, you know, from, from three hours earlier. And the, the, this woman has a daughter who's a sophomore in high school. Her parent wanted to meet twice a week for the sophomore PSAT, keeping in mind that the sophomore PSAT is a practice for the junior year PSAT, which is oh a my practice. Gosh. Oh my <laughs> gosh. <laughs> And so this girl has at least a year of math that she hasn't learned, and it's it's just it's a silly idea, to just put all this time and focus on this. So we tried to we had to talk her down from doing twice a week to only doing once a week, which even of itself is is way too much. And mom wanted all the practice; she wanted hard copies of all the practice tests that her daughter's doing, all the materials, because she wants to go through and do it herself because she feels she needs to know what her daughter's doing and be on top of what her daughter's doing oh, in order to help her daughter. And my feeling on this is that my kids' lives, or your kids' lives, all appearances to the contrary, it's their lives, right? It's their lives, and it's my job to offer help. And if they want to say, Dad, that'd be great, if say, no, Dad, I've got it, isn't that the outcome that we want for our kids to feel like in terms of their lives? Hey, hashtag, I've got it. I, I think that people... That, that has a, just dozens of these kind of stories, mm. uh, and there's no question that people who've been in education for a long time say we've never seen anything like level of anxiety in parents. And I think it's related to a, a lot of factors that Ned mentioned, uh, and, and certainly, uh, certainly the internet hasn't helped, and, and the, the, the 
prevalence of concern about uh, kids being abducted and the very, where, where the world feels so much dangerous, more dangerous now than it used to. When actually on, on virtually all other measures, we're living in the safest, most, most of us are living in the safest place in the safest time in human, famous, safest time in human history. I think it's so hard for parents, understandably, you got to keep this in perspective. And that's why we wrote this book. We wrote this book so that, that people can see the, the scientific basis, not being so fearful, not feeling that you have to micromanage your kid, not feeling that I always know what's best for my kid and that my job is to, is, is to shape my kid, as Ned likes to say, to prune him like a, like a tree. Mm. And a bit more, my job is to, to model my kid, I think the values and, and, and the coping strategies that work for me, my, my, my job is to teach where I can, where there's openness, to teach my kid. It's not to make my kid turn out a certain way. And I think that, that the more we adopt this attitude, that our job, there's a, there's a chapter in our book called um, Love You Too Much to Fight With You About Your Homework, where we introduce this idea of thinking about parents thinking themselves more as consultants to their kid, because they're the, is the manager or the boss or the taskmaster or the homework police or whatever and um so we, we one of the central ideas in this book is encouraging parents to think about themselves more as as a consultant than as, than as a manager <laughs> when the book came out one of my clients read this uh, was reading the book he sent me an email and said I just told my 13 year old son i love you much to fight with you about your homework first he smiled and then he hugged me and he said Mom, is something wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> it's a little different than their normal conversation about school, but, but yeah, yeah. That is that is fascinating, and and it's interesting because I suppose to a certain extent, a lot of us parents want to give our kids opportunities that we never had. We maybe didn't have all these tutors. We didn't get to go into uh, to Harvard necessarily. So a lot of us didn't, or or whatever dream school we had, and so we're like. Oh, my child has that chance, finally. And, and we almost, I don't know, we're like living our second lives through our kids sometimes. But, but you guys have posited that that's actually putting a lot of pressure on these kids. I think you had shared in one of your presentations that th there's like a 37 increase in depression. There's uh, higher reports of chemical use, drug use with high school kids. And a lot of it is coming from this stress, this academic stress. Right. Well, and, and you know, broadly, there's what's called a locus of control and mm. you know, an internal versus an external locus of control. And an internal, I'm in charge of this. I need to make choices. You know, my, you know, my thinking can be my thinking or, or external is, is meeting the expectations of other people. Right. And so so that that out that that latter one is really tough. I mean, principally, when I meet with, with, with girls, I'll make a point to them or the parents are within the audience that. Um, with girls, we so often early on say, oh my gosh, you're, look at you're so smart, you're so clever, you figured this out, or oh my gosh, aren't you pretty? And both of those feel lovely at first. But as you go along the line, it's not, not at all because, you know, I, I'm so smart, I'm so clever, but then I get a be on something and maybe I'm not as smart, as clever as I thought it was. Or, you know, I, I, I'm, so, I'm, so, I'm so lovely, I have such a, you know, a pretty face, but then someone looks at you and kind of up and down and goes, not so much, and it's totally externalizing that my sense of myself is based on what other people look, look at me, and so that's a real challenge. And so, to your point of you know, as parents, we want to give our kids all the opportunities in the world, and maybe ones that we ourselves lack. The challenge is how do you do that without turning an opportunity into an expectation? Wow. Comes an expectation now is that I'm looking at my kids saying. You know, look, you've had all these things and you're only performing here. Yeah. Right? And so, so now, so, so again, now it's my expectation. It's not the kid wanting to drive himself and what he wants to work for. It's that I have arbitrarily said, you should be able to do here. And I'm constantly measuring or evaluating how short of that mark. Wow. And that's just, it's just lousy. I mean, I see so often families who do what I call moving the goalpost, right? Mm. Where a kid will work really hard to grade on a test by his standards, right? And without missing the beat, the parents say, but could he get this? And the kid's like, you've got to be kidding me. Where instead, you sit there and say, really great job. You worked really hard for that. I'm so proud of you for that hard work. And more importantly, you know, or, and more so, not more importantly, more so, I'm happy that you got what you were working hard for. Mm. Let's go out and have ice cream. Mm. Then, because kids know that college is... <laughs>